Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Fadik Rahmanovich and I am joined as always by Brother Kareem. Assalamu alaikum everyone. In this series we're doing a chapter by chapter analysis of Sayyid Hussein Nasr's book, A Young Muslim's Guide to the West. We'll be focusing on one portion of the chapter in these sessions and delving more deeply into ideas within the passages. Ideas like what implications can you draw, conclusions you can come to, and showing you how to read these kinds of complex texts more closely. In today's sessions, we will be looking at chapter 10, Modern Science and uh, Technology. But, uh, before we do that, last week we uh, had a whole conversation right towards the back end of that where you asked, like, well, you know, what, what happens with, uh, with, with, with a sort of cyclical nature of this social collapse? And I actually made a, uh, a, a statement there. Uh, something regarding the idea of like, well, you know, it, it's not likely that we're going to get like the Mongolian horde descending on us anytime soon. And then, uh, you know, uh, speak of the devil kind of thing. Uh, so we recorded that uh, last Friday and what was it, on Wednesday? Friday, January 1st is when we recorded the last one. This and, is January 8th. So when yeah, did when I go down? Like two, days, two ago? days ago? I think it was two days ago. All right, so <laughs> less than a week later, what we get is quite literally the Mongolian hordes descending down on the uh, on the capital. And what actually really struck me was watching the the the, the kind of behavior and the way that these people were presenting themselves. Uh, and n never mind uh, the QAnon shaman guy who is literally sitting there looking like uh, you know Genghis Khan, but like the 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 rest of them, there is like no civilizing appearance to them, right? It's like it's dirty, worn out, untied sneakers, uh, you know. And actually, what it really reminded me of was watching those videos of uh, of ISIS going through that uh, museum in Iraq, right? I was really shocked that they didn't bust up the statues, but they did like randomly just break stuff, right? There's like videos of them just breaking windows for the sake of breaking windows, and you're like, what? Why? What there's is the videos, benefit? There's also videos of them busting statues, only for it to later be revealed that those statues are probably duplicates, and the originals were sold. <laughs> That's the ISIS thing, not not the, not the QAnon thing. thing. No, uh, although the podium of the Speaker of the House I is on eBay. You know what? <laughs> like that. That's you. You've seen those uh, th those paintings of like you know b barbarians uh, burning Rome, and they're just like walking off with the loot. Like that is the shot. That is, and he's smiling and waving to the camera. Of you saw course. That one. Like it is. That's gonna be memed to death. And, and, like, the, the, the dude with, like, his feet up on Pelosi's desk, n never mind, like, Pelosi, by the way, is, uh, let's just say I don't have a particularly high opinion of that individual, but, like, that part of it aside, the, the, the sort of yokel from nowhere look to the guy as he's looking at that male like a chimp looking at, like, something strange, like, honestly, it just... Like, every movie you've ever seen about, like, completely illiterate barbarians run, running into, like, written language and being confused by it. Like, all, that just instantaneously ran through my mind. One of her signed business cards, also now on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, so th there you go. It's, it's literally that. So I would like to walk back what I said last week about, like, we're not going to have, like, a Mongolian invasion. I no longer know that for a fact. Well, so, one of our students posted in, uh, in the group chat about how towards the end of uh, the documentary on Netflix, The Social Dilemma, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, towards the end of it, uh, there are, you know, they, they're interviewing numerous people for this. Uh, and several of them are saying near the end, you know, you know they ask them the question, like, where is this heading? this like bifurcation of society, this polarization here, which is being not just exacerbated, but in a lot of ways also caused by social media and by these algorithms that only show you what you want to see. And, 
and a lot of them end by saying, I think it's going to end in civil war. And I think it's a bit extreme and alarmist to actually say that, you know, this is, like, this is it. We're headed to civil war. But it's a pretty bad sign. I'm definitely headed in the wrong direction yeah. to avoid it. Um, you said that there was a, oh man, I, I forget who said it. No, it was, I, I think it was, um, it was like well, on one of those, I, I don't even know what they're called. It's not a ticker, it's like the little headline thing that comes up along the bottom of the I think they call screen. it a Chiron. There you go. So it was along the Chiron, um, and I think it was one of the protesters that said something like, uh, we're law-abiding citizens, we're not bad people, the government drove us to this. And at first you look at that and you go like, that's, that's ridiculous. But then you kind of stop and you think about it for a second. Law-abiding citizen would mean somebody who acts lawfully within a sort of set of uh, legitimately set up rules of a game. But if you view yourself that way, right? Like I am a I'm an American citizen. I pay taxes. I you know I, I do the things that I'm supposed to do. And then the person in charge tells you that the election was stolen. Is it coherent to think of somebody who would sit there and go like, oh well, as being law-abiding anymore? Right, like if, if somebody tries to steal your laws, then you can't sit back. Like it's entirely understandable that you have a group of people who are going to react that way if the information that they're getting is coming down from the top. And on top of that, you also have the, uh, I mean, m m both sides have sort of been running this uh, ploy with uh, uh, going against varieties of, of tech industries because whoever is losing is complaining about it. Not that there isn't a lot of legitimate stuff to complain about. But you have this idea that the that these elites are uh, somehow uh, pro-left-wing and then, when you repeat the thing that your president says, your posts are now flagged, or removed, or your account is blocked. Does that not seem entirely insane? To me, that seems like it, it's, it's not like, this isn't a crazy mob. This is an entirely coherent thing to do if you believe the person that you had elected president. And in fact, at that point, staying home would seem the irresponsible thing to do. Which isn't, by the way, to, to, to justify the, uh, the, 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 the thing, but, but it is to, to help explain it, right? This isn't like randos just sort of showing up and, and, and looting Macy's. This is, you know, that, that, that happens to be opportunistic. There was a giant mob of people who's going to, you know, be able to ID you. You can get away with some stuff and ta-da, you go off and do it. Um, although I'm sure there is some of that in here too, but it seems like it would be a rational thing to do if these were the premises that you had started on. Right. Yeah, well, let's not confuse rationality with... Um accuracy or with morality here. Yes. Yeah, so pointing out that something is rational is just saying that they're not, th there's this unfortunate tendency for people to uh, think that those who disagree with them or who do things that they think are wrong are acting irrationally, right? To call them crazy. That was kind of the go-to line uh, back not just in 2003 but even before that regarding Saddam Hussein, right? That he's a madman, he's crazy, those kinds of things, right? It's an easy way to justify um, not even having to think about why the people you disagree with are doing the things that they're doing. Right, because right? they can't be understood. Right. 
And so th th there is no coherent reason why they're acting the way they are. So, sake of argument, make any conflict where you have an insurgency, if you go like they're irrational, then what you've just done is you've removed all the weight of responsibility for the situation from yourself. There's no talking to crazy people. There's exactly. No, there's no reasoning with irrationality. So at that point, you no longer have to do anything other than condemn them and then dismiss them, rather than having to go like, hold up a second, in what way have we contributed to this problem, and therefore in what ways could we help remedy the problem? Um, and that's, that, that's a dangerous psychological little trap to fall into, because then the idea is that, um, as we mentioned, a week ago, two weeks ago, the idea of, you know, like, I'm perfect, and the other people are just psychotic. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who've seen Game of Thrones, that's Daenerys at the end of season eight. You know, like, I alone am sane. I alone am right, and everybody else is just crazy. So you can't reason with them, and so you don't need to reason with them, you just use brute force. All right, so, um, yeah, I, I just sort of wanted to, to walk that statement of, uh, like, we're not going to have Mongolian hordes back because we're getting the Mongolian hordes. But uh, besides that, I would, uh, I'd like to go through this chapter. It was kind of a fun chapter. In fact, I think we've covered at least three quarters of this uh, throughout our uh, previous talks. So let's just sort of zero in on um, on what sort of caught your attention the most, and then we'll work our way out from there. Yeah, the first thing that really stood out to me here is uh, the issue of both continuity and discontinuity of Islamic science and Western science. So that's page 182. Um, all right, can you read that part for us? It, it, it comes in a few different areas here. If you look at the bottom of the first paragraph, he is saying over here that many Muslim thinkers during the last century have written a great deal about modern science, and the majority of them, while opposing various cultural, religious, and social values of the West, have lauded Western science in an almost absolute fashion and identified it in their own mind with science as it, as it was known in Islamic civilization. Most have, in fact, claimed that modern science is nothing but the continuation and further development of Islamic science in the context of the Western world. Now, he disagrees with this idea. He does point out early on in the next paragraph that uh, a lot of modern science would not have been possible without the works of figures such as Ibn Sina in medicine, the mathematics of Chayyam, or the optics of Ibn al-Haytham. And then the next sentence is really the key there. He says, yet there is not only a continuity between the two sciences, but also a profound discontinuity between Western science and Islamic science. So he starts with the continuity, which is, yes, it is true, if it weren't for the work of many Islamic scientists, over the centuries, uh, a lot of what we think of as modern science wouldn't have gotten going, really. But there is at the same time a large difference, he calls it a profound discontinuity between Western science and Islamic science. So what is this discontinuity? Well, I think the best way to look at it is to compare the two, Islamic science with Western science. Islamic science is rooted in knowledge based on the unity of Allah, Tawheed. In contrast, in modern science, the natural world is separate from Allah and higher levels of being. So in Islamic science, Allah's wisdom and will rule. But in modern science, Allah does not intrude into the world or, as he puts it, provide its sustenance. 
So we've got a key difference right there between the two. Now those serve more as the axiomatic differences there. Islamic science also says that all things are interrelated, reflecting unity on a cosmic level. Whereas in modern science, the physical world is an independent reality. In modern science, we think that we can study and know things without any reference to a higher reality. While in Islamic sciences, you always relate what's at lower levels of being to higher levels of being. And this life, this existence of ours, would be considered the lowest level of being. So there's a certain separation that exists here in modern Western science compared to Islamic sciences. Uh, in addition, we have the idea that in modern science everything has a materially defined or a mathematically defined cause. Now, one of the major uh, outcomes of this line of thinking is that for modern science the goal ultimately is power and dominion over nature. I believe on page 189 he quotes uh, Francis Bacon who he mentions and discusses briefly in the previous chapter as being uh, the person who stated this idea quite clearly. So, a lot of people consider him, Francis Bacon, I mean, to be uh, kind of, you could say, the founder of um, modern science, or the father, you could say. Uh, his idea here is that the goal of science is giving man power and dominion over nature, and as a result of that, uh, he supports state investment into science because it's a means to increase state power. It increases economic power, military power, that kind of thing. So, it may be, uh, it may be a little tricky for, for people to understand this idea of, uh, first off, like what exactly is meant by higher realities, um, and certainly this idea of relations is not sort of readily apparent to us, uh, especially if you're, uh, if you're brought up in, uh, in the West. Like, what exactly is this supposed to mean? You know, are you supposed to uh, praise God after you do a math problem? Like, what exactly are you supposed to go for? And I, uh, I, I'm going to put up a visual here. But the idea, or a, a decent way of thinking about this, actually comes from, uh, man, like, 1960s were a really productive time for, uh, for a whole lot of these thinkers uh, who, who end up challenging this, but uh, you have this guy by the name of Arthur Kossel, and the book is called uh, Ghost in the Machine, and this is section one, subsection three, he introduces this idea of, uh, of holons, and, uh, well, actually, uh, let me backtrack a second, first this idea of, like, higher reality. And I think we, we might have actually talked about this in our very first lecture, right? So if, uh, if you go outside, well, maybe not now because it's just January, but if uh, you go outside and you, you, see, uh, you see a plant, and uh, you know the, the, the plant is getting some nutrients from the ground, some sunshine, and some water, and yet there's like a whole bunch of different parts of this plant, and they're all doing different things and you know it's uh, if you get at all into uh, into botany you start finding out all these incredibly insane and uh, intricate things that, that plants do you go well, hold on a second right like the that's not just the interplay of, of various elements right like if I took those elements and I just sort of smushed them together if I reduce that plant to its chemical components, I put those components in a bag and I shake it up, I am not going to get what that plant is doing. 
And so, as soon as you look at that, you go like, well, hold on, there has to be some sort of a principle by which this flame is doing what it's doing, right? It's not in the matter itself, because if I just have the various uh, matter components and I stick them together, they won't do the same thing. So there, there, there is some sort of a guiding principle that's actually making the plant do this. And then we did a whole bunch of research and whatnot, and we start finding about uh, finding out about DNA and things like that. And then we're like, oh, you know, that that's the that that's the guiding principle. Uh, you, I mean, you sort of stop wondering about these things when you're like three, but it, it is kind of cool to bring yourself back to that point. You you, you drop something and it falls down. And you go like, okay, why is it falling down? Well, because there's a principle at play, and that principle is gravity. And then you go like, okay, what is gravity? And the answer is we still have no clue. Uh, but, you know, th th there's some sort of a, a thing that isn't materially there in the sense of, like, y y you can't poke it with a stick, right? But it's like a set of rules that's going to govern how these things behave under very particular circumstances, which is then going to give you the, the thing. And then you can start asking about the principles that guide the principles that are there. And that's part of what, uh, what physics, for example, is trying to do materially when they're trying to figure out things like uh, the, uh, the sort of universal constants that are at play everywhere throughout the universe. Uh, that then limit the sorts of things that are possible inside of the universe. Things like, but now you're talking about principles of principles, so that's an even higher order set of rules and regulations. And if you look back into uh, Islamic thought, amongst others, uh, you will find that this way of thinking, right, looking for principles, uh, has led a whole lot of these uh, classical thinkers to conclude with the idea of God. Right? Well, there's a set of principles. Well, the principles above them must have more sort of room to operate because they're constraining these lower level principles. The same way that those lower level principles are constraining matter in what it can do. Right? And so on and so forth until you finally get to the principle which is divine will. Which might be restricted by something like uh, uh, the, the law of non-contradiction, right? You can't want and not want the exact same thing that the, in, in the exact same way at the same time, right? It, it would run into a, a self-contradiction. But other than that, you go like that. There is no limit on it. It is it is the thing that allows for everything else to to be, and without that thing, nothing else would would stand. So that that's this idea of relating to things that are higher up. So. It's, uh, you're relating up to, to higher principles, you're relating those principles higher up into this hierarchy uh, that's ordered in the, the way that everything works. And that's, that's one way of looking at it. The other way, and this is going back to, to Kostler, he introduces this idea uh, called holons, H-O-L-O-N-S. Uh, and he gets that word by combining the Greek word for whole and the Greek word for part. Uh, and it's supposed to mean a, a whole part, or a part whole. Uh, and his sort of sales pitch is something like this. Nothing in the universe is ever completely a complete thing, nor is it ever just a part of something else. It's always both, and it's all a matter of perspective. So, you are a complete human being. But you, uh, the material you, is made up of a bunch of uh, organ systems. And then, let's say, the, the, the waste management organ system is made up of a bunch of different organs and processes, and let's say kidneys are a part of that. Now, you look at the kidney, and each kidney is a complete organ. But it, it is only part of a larger system, which is part of you. And then each kidney can be broken down into uh, substructures, which can then be broken down into further substructures, which can then be broken down into cells. And at each of these levels, the thing is complete, right? Like each cell of your body, each organelle inside of each cell is a complete thing. So it is a whole 
when sort of looking from its perspective down. It is made up of other stuff, so it is the whole. But as, as you look up, you realize that you are just part of something else. You are never independently off on the side. Now, this is going to matter quite a bit for this way of, of thinking about uh, nature and uh, both the, the problems and the prescribed solution here by NASA because he's talking about how we need to find a way of harmoniously integrating into nature but that only works if when you look at yourself as an individual and as part of humanity uh, or as humanity as a whole which is then part of the planet right you realize that you're not standing apart from everything else you are in fact part of everything else so you have to figure out what is your proper position and what is that position supposed to do and how do you integrate into the world in such a way as to not obliterate the entire hierarchical structure so these are the the the, the two things right like one is uh, sort of looking up like relating what you're discovering scientifically upwards uh, and the other one is that, that sort of integrating into a, a, a hierarchy, a continuum of what is actually going on. Uh, I'll put uh, links to videos on both of these things uh, in the description uh, here where that's explained at greater length. I'd also highly recommend uh, Ghost in the Machine because it's a, it's a crazy good book. Now, what occurs to me when you're saying this is people are inevitably going to say that at some point in time when you reach a certain I guess you'd say height in this process at some point there, there, it has to stop right there has to be a certain whole that isn't also the part of something else that's above it otherwise it goes on ad infinitum correct right so from an Islamic standpoint, that stopping point is Allah. Right. Allah is not the part of some other whole. Correct. Everything is that part is, of That him. is impossible based Although. upon our understanding of what Allah is. Right. From the modern standpoint, it seems that that point is the physical world. Well, I mean, y y you can you can do that, but I'm not the, saying they're correct. I'm saying the, that, that seems that that's the stopping point in terms of going up. Just as it seems like they're trying to find a stopping point in terms of going down, as well. Yes, yeah, the smallest. I, is there a certain lowest point? They thought, okay, it must be the atom. Okay, no. Eventually, we discover there are subatomic particles. Okay, well. Are the subatomic particles made of something? Oh yes, we discovered that they are made of something. They're made of something called quarks. Okay, maybe that's the smallest thing that could possibly exist. Because once again, that would have to be a whole that has no parts. And then we're like, ah, uh, no, wait a second. I think those are made up of things too. Yeah, and we might all be just 11-dimensional vibrating strings. Uh, Log up the string theory. <laughs> right. I don't know much about string theory, but something tells me that we'll, we'll eventually get to the point where we're saying, all right, but what are those made of? Well, the the, the idea, at least, that the way it's being pitched, is that uh, something like, if you accept string theory, you'll do a couple of things. One is you'll resolve the the, the incompatibility between micro and macro uh, physics, which is currently there with quantum mechanics. Uh, and the other thing is that the, these eleven-dimensional strings aren't uh, aren't supposed to need parts, supposedly. Uh, look, it, it, it's, it's a whole uh, mess. It, it's certainly not like anybody's sort of puzzled this bit of it out. Uh, if you want a really cool book about it, there is, uh, I want to say Brian Green, Green with an E at the end, uh, has a book called uh, Elegant Universe. Uh, and it, it's a really cool book because uh, even if you're not into physics, I think he only uses a grand total of two equations. Uh, but like the first half of the book is he walks you through uh, like classical physics up to and through 
Einstein, and then he's going to pitch his idea for for the string theory. So it's like a really cool uh, layman's primer to to understanding what's happening in, uh, in physics. I'll, I guess I'll put a link to that too. So there is, uh, in terms of like what modern science does, one there's sort of the, the scope, and you're right there. It's it's the universe, right? So that that, that is the 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 upper end of uh, of wholeness. But there is also a sort of temporal effect in terms of uh, forces that are at play. So if the size of the universe is a sort of outer edge of, uh, of what's where the laws come from, then time-wise, the Big Bang, or whatever the source is, uh, is going to be the, 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 the temporal start of the universe, which is then going to somehow bestow the, the kinds of properties on the universe that will allow it to be the size that it is and the shape that it, that it is and these rules are going to be exactly what they are inside of there rather than being anything else uh, and th that that's the other sort of uh, thing that we're trying to, to nail down in physics it sort of seem to be like the, the two big uh, features all of that sort of fine, and this is, I mean, it's, it's a feature, and somewhere in this chapter, it also brings it up. When you talk to the scientists who are doing this, the actual scientists tend to uh, have a good sense of what it is that their field is supposed to do. So if you ask a question like, well, what came before the Big Bang, or like, what caused the Big Bang? The answer in physics is, that's not our problem, right? Because anything that happens before the Big Bang isn't taking place in the universe. And so it is outside of the realm of what physics is attempting to study. That the same way that if you ask them, you know, like, is this a pretty painting? Right? Like, just, it, it's not their job to, to answer that. Uh, we have the, the same thing with, uh, with, um, uh, biology and trying to explain the, the origin of life. Uh, again, that, that's not a problem for biology. Biology is a study of living beings. Uh, what creates the initial sort of living beings is not really part of biology. You're, you'd have to be studying non-living matter in order to explain that, right? If you take the sort of mechanical uh, uh, approach to the universe. So that's not a question for biology, and if a biologist is, is trying to answer that question through biology, he's sort of doing it wrong. That's, let's say, an approach difference, uh, a conceptual difference between what modern science and what Islamic science uh, do. Islamic science is attempting to relate what it's learning sort of up this hierarchy of, uh, of existence and at the same time use that information to better situate itself within the uh, within that hierarchy of existence so as to integrate within within that setup and be able to properly uh, function the sort of western science francis bacon on tries to extricate humanity from that hierarchy and put us off on the side. And actually, not not on the side, that's incorrect. Uh -oh. He tries to pull us out and then place us at the top so that everything is subservient to us. And so the only reason why these things exist is so that they can serve our needs, and if it's not serving my needs, then it might as well not exist, or rather, it's okay to wipe it out. Uh, now, what he doesn't sort of get into uh, here, but he will uh, mention in his uh, book, Man and Nature, is where this attitude in the West seems to draw at least some origin from, and that actually happens to be the, uh, the Old Testament uh, account of, the, uh, of human beings. 
So when Adam is created, uh, this is an Old Testament, uh, so that should be Genesis, right? Uh, period, there's this idea that Adam names all the things. And the, the idea of naming isn't like attaching abstract syllables to objects and going like, it's a giraffe. Ooh, I put syllables together. Like the, uh, To name a thing is to give it meaning, to properly situate it in a hierarchy uh, of meaning to you. Now, whoever does the naming inherently injects a value into what that thing is. So if Adam is the one who does the naming, then the value of a, of a mosquito and a value of a giraffe and a value of a cow only exists in the sense that Adam has some sort of value from these things. So a mosquito is only an irritant from your perspective uh, and therefore mosquitoes have no value and therefore it's okay to wipe them all out. And at least that's a sales pitch and then you realize that they're major pollinators and then you know they're not trying to wipe out your entire uh, country. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's not wrong necessarily to point out the kinds of value that a lot of other creatures have to the ecosystem, but at the same time, someone who uses that as their reason for why we shouldn't wipe species out is still, even if unwittingly, falling prey to the same kind of materialism. Yes. Because they are still saying we should preserve this for us. No, I'm uh, sorry, that, that, that's not uh, materialism, that's uh, instrumentalism. The, the thing is, only has value insofar as uh, I can derive value from it, i.e. I'm using it as an instrument, it is a means to an end, it has no value in and of itself, but only as a way of getting to something else. Um, but yeah, so, so you're right, you're, you're sort of stuck in that loop, and we mentioned that with, uh, with Zizek and trying to uh, solve the problems created by capitalism by doing more capitalism to it. And it's like, no, no, that, that's just not going to, uh, that's not going to fly. Uh, the Islamic conception, and you'll find, uh, it's certainly not the same story, but the same sort of output uh, in, in Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism, uh, and certainly Native American uh, ideas. is the idea that, uh, like, Adam doesn't name the things. He is taught the names of things by God. So who does the naming? God. In other words, the value of a thing is now relative to God, not relative to human beings. And we are explained what the value of the thing is to God. So all things now have intrinsic value that is entirely... In, uh, untethered to us. So, yes, the mosquito is an irritant to me, but a mosquito inherently has value because uh, I'm not the thing that created it, right? So the creator of the thing gets to decide the, uh, the, the, the value. And th this is part of the reason why this idea of integrating yourself into the larger whole is so critical, Islamically speaking, because Everything has a purpose, uh, and it's, in essence, the same purpose that humanity has. Right? And Islamically, that purpose is to uh, worship God in the way that you're supposed to. Now, we don't worship God the same way as whatever ants do, but, I mean, so all things other than things with free will worship God uh, by the very fact of their existence. Right, lacking free will means that they just do what they've been programmed to do, and in doing so, if uh, if their purpose is to praise God, they can't possibly fail at that purpose. Sure. Right. And that's, so, no, that's not just beings on earth; that includes angels as well. But that, yeah, that that is every everything everywhere that lacks free will. So everything that can't screw up is by default perfect uh, in its execution of its duties because it has no choice. Right, so, uh, but perhaps you don't want to call that moral, but it's it's incapable of being immoral. So best best alternative is to call it amoral. 
you can't pass judgment. You yeah, you cannot pass judgment on it at all. Would be the alternative to like it is inherently doing its job and it's doing it perfectly. Um, and so I'm aware of at least one deviant sect who calls themselves Muslims who say that Jibril basically made a mistake. Yeah, right? no. Oh, yeah, no, he <laughs> was supposed to go to Ali or something. It's like, well, if you understand what you were just talking about there, that is a impossibility for being without free will to, quote, make a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, you can't. Well, I, I, this is why uh, not to uh, not to sort of pile on to uh, to Christianity here, but the the idea of uh, of Lucifer being uh, a fallen angel. Well, if angels are the the means by which message is delivered, by which prophets are informed that they're prophets, so on and so forth. Uh, if angels can make mistakes, then you no longer have any sort of guarantee about your message, because the the, the means of transferring that message are no longer uh, vouchsafe. Uh, anywho, the the idea being something like if if we have a purpose and we have a uh, if we have free will, um, and we are put into a system where other things also have their purpose, then an inherent part of our purpose has to be to respect the purpose of other things. So you're not allowed to act in ways that will destructively, negatively affect the ability of other things to fulfill their purpose. Does that make sense? Sure. Right? So like if um, if both of us work for Bob, who's our boss, and uh, I'm a messenger who's supposed to deliver message A and you're a messenger who's supposed to deliver message B, I can't say that I'm acting uh, that, that I'm acting on Bob's orders if I'm preventing you from doing your job. Right? Because you have orders from Bob to do your job. So anytime I interfere with you, I'm actually uh, I'm, I'm messing with your ability to do your job, to actually fully carry it out, uh, and that means that I'm also, by that fact alone, not doing my job correctly. So since we're put into a situation where everything else has a purpose, the only appropriate way to be is to uh, adapt to the way that everything else is doing its job so that you're causing the least amount of disturbance to everything else, and therefore you're derailing it uh, to the least extent uh, necessary. Now, th this isn't to say that, you know, like we, we need to go live in caves, uh, because otherwise we might disturb uh, whatever. But it is to say that the, the way that we go about doing things needs to be thought out, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. Uh, I can't just sort of rush headlong into, into doing things without actually stopping to think about the consequences and what the effects are going to be and uh, all the rest of that, even if I believe that there is no negative side to it. And look, th that second part comes from uh, that there is a hadith, let me actually just pull it up because I had it in that paper. So it's through, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, the uh, it's the Musnad and uh, Ibn Majah hadith collections, uh, and it says uh, it is narrated that a God's messenger appeared while Saad was uh, taking uh, ablutions, right, wudu, and, and yeah, when he saw that Saad was using a lot of water, he intervened, saying, "What's this? You're wasting water." Sa'ad replied, asking, Can there be wastefulness while taking the ablutions? To which God's messenger replied, Yes, even if you take them on the bank of a rushing river. So, you have a necessary prerequisite of a mandatory act, a 
that, that is what Wudu is. And even there, there is a categorical prohibition of the abuse of a resource, even where that resource is plentiful, it's free, and its use seems to cause no apparent harm either to the resource or to the environment, right? It's not like even if you had a lot of water, it's like even if you were on the banks of a rushing river, I mean, where does the water drip off of you? as you day for do on the banks of a rushing river. Well, right back into the river. But the idea that you're reaching for more than what you need in order to accomplish a task is where the problems are sort of kicking in. So, we consume some ungodly quantity of electricity in this country. In 2018, U.S. primary energy consumption was that ridiculous large number of units there, which was about 17% of total world primary energy consumption. Whereas, so basically 4% of the world's population, 17% of energy consumption. All right. So I, now, related enough. to what <laughs> you're talking about here, there is an idea that's worth looking into. Uh, I've seen it mostly as more of a buzzword, so I'm not putting a lot of faith in it, but it's still an idea that's worth looking into. It's the concept of sustainability. You'll see this is a very popular term, especially like in UN and international relations kinds of circles lately. But as the name says there, the idea of sustainability is you know, basically the, the goal of us as a world getting to the point where we can coexist with the environment without using it up. So let's say that you need one million trees for a certain purpose. Well, we can be sure that there's going to be one million more to take its place in that particular time period. Sustainable development is a great goal, but I do want to remind you that we have to go back to the earlier idea of like why you're doing it as well. So if the sole goal of sustainable development is, again, just instrumentalism, that's different from the end goal being everything has value to it, so therefore it's wrong to destroy the environment, and everything has value because God gave it value, not because it has value just because it helps us. Now, just because so many people hold to that idea for the former reason, the idea of instrumentalism, does not change the fact that it's still a good goal. It's a good example of the kind of situation where we can work with people who disagree with us on a certain goal, or sorry, certain people disagree with us on the why, but we can still work with them to a certain goal when that's something that we share. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a solid example of uh, why you don't need people to agree with you on anything uh, to still manage to uh, fix a problem. But it's, uh, it, it, it is sort of an interesting um, issue because all of the traditional societies always did have this set of ideas in mind, right? Like har being able to live with something uh, harmoniously, right, and it's always like w with the with the environment. It always had this sort of element of um, you you needed to yeah. So uh, the idea of harmonious meaning functional, so that the, the the world does what you're trying to get it to do. Uh, stable, dynamic, sustainable, long term, and scalable. Right, uh, an idea that you have that's sustainable for you, but it only works. It only works if you apply it to a small number of people. It, 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 it's a bad idea. That there's something ultimately broken with it. Right. So because humanity, because that's sort of what we do, will eventually take on the whole, the idea as a whole. 
whatever your idea is, it has to work when applied to everybody. So if, uh, whatever, for, for capitalistic purposes, if it's, uh, well listen, you know, if we only have some sweatshops, then uh, we can make cheap clothes, that doesn't want to work long term, because those people have, will eventually climb out of poverty, and uh, they're not going to want to work in these sweatshops, because they will actually have other opportunities, and now what? Right, that, that, that's an example of a non-scalable thing uh, in the, the sort of sustainable, harmonious uh, way of things working or not working. Yeah, that, that's an interesting example because the solution we have right now is move to the next place, right? I, it, it is interesting also you mentioned that. I'm reminded there are, I forget the name, I forget who it was, but I've heard certain political philosophers or, or you know, political thinkers in general say things like, you know, at the national level, I'm a libertarian, or I'm a capitalist. At the individual level, or like at the family level, I realize I'm basically a socialist. Right? I mean, in terms of one's interactions with one's family, do you operate in a capitalist or a libertarian mindset? Not really. I would hope not. Imagine that kind of family structure. It would be incredibly dysfunctional. So this idea of everyone pulling together, everyone sharing things, uh, yeah, it, it works really great at, at the family level. But can you universalize that to unrelated people? Probably not. No. I mean, ultimately, the idea that we are all one human family, these things don't really work in practice. But that doesn't mean, though, that we say, well, therefore, uh, we shouldn't be functionally socialists at the family level it's more the it's more just that the the terminology that we're using of thinking in terms of socialism is perhaps an incorrect terminology even if it functions correctly yeah yes it's a weird one I, I've never actually stopped to think about it that way but yes although it, it, it do much in family socialism is going to um, cause one of the problems that uh, you touched on last week, the idea of uh, uh, hard times create good men, good men create good times, good times create weak men, right? So, weak men create hard times, yeah. They're... So if, if you make things too easy, not on your family, sort of like in general, I'm not saying like you've got to be a jerk at least 20% of the time to keep them running smoothly, but if if you make things too easy on your kids, right, one, if they don't have to work for a thing, right, so they pick a goal and they have to learn how to get there and they realize that if they have to suffer in order to get what they want. Suffer here is in quotes because, you know, uh, it's relative, suffering. Uh, and do, if you don't, at least at some point, let them suffer for their for their failures then you're creating uh, a generation of people who are incompetent and y you're doing that because you're trying to be nice and you love your kids and you don't want them to, to, to suffer and to feel pain and to be sad and all the rest of that but ultimately you're setting them up for for worse Right, so like being overprotective of a child uh, leaves them in a position where they're sort of incapable of uh, properly socializing in the, in the world. Right, and we see the failures of that. There was, uh, it's now the old term, people still use it, but the term helicopter parenting was around for a long time. The new one is bulldozer parenting. <laughs> Essentially, they come along this bulldoze away all the problems, leaving a nice clear path for their children to go through. And these things seem to be, I mean, they, they clearly must be based out of love, right? It's just that it's a kind of misplaced love. Because if you want what's best for your kids, that doesn't mean that you give them a world that looks nothing like what they're actually going to face when they're on their own out there in the working world. Well. I mean, you say misplaced love. I've heard this from a, from a couple of psychologists, uh, Dr. Peterson included. But this idea of 
of that sort of love not actually being a love for the child, but a love for oneself. It's just sort of like selfish. Uh, if, if you think of the sort of stereotypical uh, doting mother of a of a psychopath murderer, right? It, it's always that very unhealthy relationship. Uh, and it's this idea of like, I will keep you safe, but really it's not out of concern for the child. It's out of the desires of the parent. Right? Like, I want you to myself, I don't want you to go away, I don't want you to... Right? In, in essence, it's like, I don't want to worry about where you are, so I'm just going to lock you up in the basement, and that way I'll always know where you are. Right? It's not... It's not... You're not doing it out of, like, concern for the kid. You're doing it for yourself, and it is highly problematic uh, for those individuals. It's like... If, if your kid never gets sick, what you have is an adult with essentially a non-existent immune system. Like getting sick lets your body go like, oh, this is how we deal with this. Now, you don't, you know, go and expose your kid to Ebola to see if, you know, he'll get over it. But you got to let them, you know, be kids. they got to scrape their knee. It's going to hurt. You know, uh, if, if you're a boy, you're... You'll probably get into a fight with your friends, and somebody will punch someone else, and like whatever, you'll have a swollen lip for a week, and then you'll get over it, and then you'll know what it's like to get punched in the face, or get into a fight with your siblings. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, it was, there was a TV show. I think it was the Cosby Show that satirized this idea. You know, the kids are all like, "He's touching me, he's touching me," kind of thing, and Cosby's like, "All right." No one in this family touches anyone else anymore. That's <laughs> it. No touching. Right? They're essentially making fun of that idea. Oh, man. Uh, I mean, I, you, you give him some boxing gloves, you let him go at it. <laughs> in a safe and controlled way. <laughs> yeah. Relating this back to what we were talking about earlier, there, there seems to be a problem here re regarding why we have kids there, right? The, the, the more traditional understanding, I guess, would be something more like, we have children because this is what we have to do, this is what it's right to do, right? You form a family, you, you teach your children the values, you pass down culture to the next generation, you equip them with the skills that they'll need to be functional members of society, and then they will be, and society will continue to exist and not get dysfunctional. But instead, if you have children for the purposes of your own self-actualization, that's where we get a lot of these problems. Having children to make yourself happy. Right? Yes, having children should make you happy. <laughs> right? But is that why you're doing it? That's an important question. And I don't, I don't mean to get into a super controversial issue here, but, uh, you know, I the vast majority of the reasons for abortions are because of essentially selfish reasons, and it goes back to that same kind of idea. And there's a... just so we hopefully make it a little bit less uh, controversial, there is... Uh, oh, I can't find it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll find the thing and I'll, I'll put it up. There's a... There's an organization, they're pretty left-leaning, uh, and every six years or so they do this massive national survey. Uh, uh, Are you talking about the Guttmacher Institute? Yes! Yeah. Uh, so I think I may have been the one to tell you about that. But yeah, they, um, they look into the reasons why, and it was quite eye-opening for me. I guess you could say they're left-leaning because they're definitely in favor of abortion, but in their research, they are trying their hardest to be as neutral and objective as possible. Right. And so, yes, in, in one of their big studies, they are looking at the reasons why people get abortions. Now, their reason for doing it is to help inform people, like policymakers. And by being better informed, you can make better decisions. Right? So I don't get the impression that they're an advocacy group, necessarily so much as they are trying to help people make better decisions, but still within the framework of basically the pro-choice side of things. 
and yeah, it, it's it's really fascinating to look at their reason or not their reasons, but uh, you know the reasons for women getting abortions. Um, it's never one reason. It's yeah, like an average I, around I, three. I, I really like yeah. actually that that part of that questionnaire that they use uh, uh, allows the uh, the participants to select as many of the reasons uh, as they uh, as they want essentially, and. Uh, and so it, it doesn't sort of force you into uh, in like, well, what's my primary reason for it? It's like, no, it's just sort of like list all people the reasons. As well, for like, what what was the single most important one? But yeah, the it, it is really valuable how they list a bunch of them. And, and yeah, I have had people get pissed off at me before for using the word selfish in that regard. But when the dominant reasons are things like, I didn't feel like I was ready. I mean, how are you going to look at those and not say that they're selfish reasons? But there, there's a, that sort of, uh, you, you just sort of hop back onto this idea of, of principles and properly situating yourself in a hierarchy of things. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of at a loss when, when I see people with uh, live-in boyfriend, girlfriends, whatever it is. And you go like, well, why aren't you married? And they go like, you know, I'm not ready for marriage. But you're doing everything else that carries all the risks of marriage, other than like whatever divorce court might do to you. Uh, but end up with a kid, uh, i.e. get stuck to this person for like the next two decades, kind of thing. Right, like all of that's on the table, but somehow you're not ready for a kid. Like, if you're not ready for marriage, you shouldn't be in, in that kind of a relationship to begin with. Like, if you're not ready, then the fact that you can accidentally end up stuck to this person as per marriage for the next 20 years or longer um, is probably a pretty good indicator that you shouldn't be in a relationship to, to begin with. But because now relationships are about self-actualization and, like, say, variety of selfish reasons, uh, which, granted, marriage is in and of itself a, a sort of uh, an institution that definitely allows you to sort of push that, your, your, your selfishness, so to speak, right? Uh, you're looking for a person who fits requirements A, B, C. But you do kind of have to uh, give back the, the, the same thing to, to the other person, right? And thus you get a match, right? I'm looking for ABC, they're looking for, you know, BGF, and it's like, hey, hey, there we go. Congratulations, we found, like, if I happen to have those qualities and they have those qualities, then you have some kind of a match. Uh, but what a marriage is for, and this actually, it, it came up before the Supreme Court uh, a couple of times, right? Like, the, these used to be traditional ways of, of understanding things upon which we based society. Right? The individual was not the basic building block of society, it was the family, because an individual can't individually procreate, we don't, we're not, you know, amoebas. And so you, you had to be able to get together with another person and then form a functional unit in a society and then when you had kids you would produce at least a replacement for yourself within that society. That was the goal. Now, if you happen to be sterile or, I don't know, a uh, 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 mule kicked you in the hoo-hahs when you were like 10 or something and now you can't have kids, that's incidental, right? But the primary purpose of marriage used to be this thing, right? And again, we're back to this idea of everything having a purpose. And it was a single set sort of objective purpose. But as we talked about in the, in the sort of last chapter and the one before that, the idea of, ob of objective purpose is more or less out the window at this point. So what is the purpose of having a child? Well, it's whatever you want it to be. And if you understand the world that way, I can totally understand why the idea of I don't feel ready is the most common answer that seems to be given. And I understand how those people think that way because these, these are their sort of like starting assumptions. 
So you, you the the important thing, I think, and so like w whether or not you, you sort of get in trouble over that. The idea of calling, uh, let's say, uh, abortions for that reason or other behaviors that, that sort of resemble that, like what you will and you won't do in society, the idea of calling it selfish is not a, a, a sort of way of denigrating the people that do it. It's more of, let's say, a traditional perspective on what's going on. Because from a traditional standpoint, that really does read as selfish, right? Like, if, if these are your starting premises, then the idea that you would uh, behave in these ways seems to be emphasizing your preferences at the cost of everything else. Ergo, selfish. But view that from the perspective of a person that has those different starting premises, it's what's normal, and you appear to be the, 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 the weird one. This, by the way, is why I think so many people have a hard time communicating with others uh, about the sort of uh, tricky issues, because nobody sort of stops and go like, well, how is the other person imagining the world if this is a normal kind of behavior for them? And when people don't take the time to do that, that's where we circle all the way back to the first thing that we talked about today where we get people storming the Capitol. Yes. Oh, man. All right, so we are at a, um, at a minute nine. I think we've covered just about all of this. Oh, that, that there is just sort of, as a, as a really quick um, line-up, one-liner, and it actually connects with the very last thing we said here. Um, on page 186, bottom of that middle paragraph, you have this line, uh, Nassif says, Consequently, the theory of evolution continues to be taught in the West as a scientific fact rather than a theory, and whoever opposes it is usually brush brushed off as a religious ob obscurantist. Obs obscurantist. Someone who obscures. Ta-da! Yes. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Uh, but the, the, the part that I just want to draw attention to here right quick is the way that Nasser is using uh, the, the phrase uh, rather than a theory. Uh, what he means by theory here, and although you may not be picking up on it from this text, if you do read his other stuff, which I have, uh, particularly Man and Nature, the idea is, uh, what he means by theory here isn't, isn't the way that, for example, you'll hear a lot of people go like, oh, you know, that's just a theory as in, like, uh, it hasn't been, quote, proven. Uh, what he means by it is something like an axiomatic underlying set of principles on which you are going to rely in order to build up the rest of your idea. Now, anything that's axiomatic has to be accepted on faith, right? It, it's not a thing that you need to prove. It's a thing that you take as a starting position, and then you build on top of it, right? So... For example, the, the uh, scientific materialism in the West is also a theory, in the sense that the way that it works is something like this. You say, if it is true that all things that are real can be quantified, and nothing which cannot be quantified exists, then modern physics. right? And that is a perfectly legitimate thing to do. The problem for us seems to be that we keep forgetting that there's a word if that precedes the entire thing. And so, forgetting the if, we go like, oh, the world is materialistic, and that means this, and therefore, here's our conclusion, right? And now it must be true. It's like, no, it's actually a hypothetical, right? So, if materialism is true, then you get something like evolution out of it, at least uh, the way that we understand evolution these days, rather than, let's say, somebody like El Jah has understood it. So, if materialism is true, then you get this bit of evolution, uh, and you can't challenge it because it's sitting right on their primary axiom. Right? That they can, like, it's not up for debate. And I think he points out the idea, it goes like, it's if they let this thing go, the, the whole system collapses. 
so they have to hold on to it. Uh, but there is no reason why that needs to be the way that we interpret the uh, the, the world. It's a hypothetical uh, antecedent to to modern uh, science. And I believe we've discussed scientism. Yes. In one of our earlier. Yeah, in like podcasts. two or three of them actually. Yeah. So that's uh, that's uh, j just want to draw attention to the way that he's using the word theory here, so that there's no uh, additional uh, confusion. All right, with that, it is oh my god, it's an hour fourteen. I guess I'll cut like maybe four minutes, so hour ten at the end. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and uh, if you got questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below or email me, and I will see everybody next week.